John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. Here, I'm going to say some things about the way that Geoffrey Chaucer introduces the characters of the prioress, the monk, and the friar in the general prologue to his Canterbury Tales. I'm skipping over some of the characters to go straight to the prioress. The prioress is the nun in charge of a monastery, other nuns. <clears throat> there was also a nun, a prioress, that of her smiling was full, simple, and coy. Her great thought was supposed to be a saint of boy. And she was clever, Madam Eglant. <clears throat> I'll translate for you. There was also a nun, and she smiled very meekly, very simply, very coyly. And she didn't curse. Her greatest oh was by Saint Loy. And she was called Madame Eglantine. Now, for Chaucer's original audience, presumably, this would have been the first hint that there was more to this prioress, more to this nun, than meets the eye. There's a kind of characteristic ambiguity even in Madame Eglantine's name. The word Eglantine refers to a kind of briar rose. And in medieval England, there was a current tradition that held that the soldiers who arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane put a crown of thorns from the Eglantine on his head. So there is an association of the name Eglantine with the Passion of Christ but the name also carries connotations of worldliness, pleasure, and sensuality. So she's got one of these romantic, very fashionable names. And she can sing very well the divine songs, the, the hymns. She sings nicely through her nose. Maybe she affects that. And she speaks French. That's a mark of the upper class. But the French she speaks is the, not exactly the kind they speak really in Paris. Uh, so she may be putting on airs a little bit. Lest you think that she's crude or low class, let me tell you, she could handle her food. She let no morsel of meat drop from her lips onto her breast. She never dipped her fingers in her sauce. She was very courteous, and she, she had good table manners. She wiped her lips so clean after she drank a, from a greasy cup that you couldn't see anything on her lip or in the cup. And also, she was of great comportment, and she was pleasant and amiable. Let me tell you about her conscience. She's a Christian lady. You know, Christians should have a heightened conscience. She was so charitable that she would weep if she saw a mouse caught in a trap if it bled or if it were dead. Tender-hearted she was. She kept some little lap dogs and she fed them with roasted flesh, with roasted meat and with milk and with sweet bread. That sounds strange for a nun. Doesn't say anything about how she feels about poor people who are starving. But if one of those little hounds were dead, but she would soar away if she wanted him when a dead, or if men smote it with a yell of smirt, and all with conscience and tender heart. Full samely her wimple pinched was, and nose twenty silly and gray as glass, her mouth full small, and they're too soft and red, but secretly she had a fair forehead. It was all loose to spy and brood, she throw, for hardly she was not undergrow. Full fetid was her cloak as I was wore, a small coral about her arm, she bare a pair of beds, gowded all with grain, and there on hung a boat of gold full of shame, on which there was first written a crowned eye, and after a more vinked omnia. Love conquers all. What kind of love is she talking about? Sarah? Um, she's talking about romantic love rather than religious love. Maybe not love of God. 
She has this romantic phrase. It could be taken equivocally. And because we know that she has a red lips and a small mouth and, and all of these affectations and manners, uh, uh, we may think that maybe it wasn't her first choice to go into the monastery. And in fact, in her defense, it would be very common for women of the noble class at this period, if they couldn't find a husband by a certain age, to be kind of forced into the monastery. But she is satirized. So that's the prioress, and another nun with her had a she, that was her chaplain, and priests and three, and three priests. Now, there's a monk, you expect a monk to have taken a vow of poverty and to be devoted to his religious duty. But this monk, he, he lives a life of luxury. A monk there was, a fair for the maestri, an after that love of venery, a manly man, to be an avid boy able. Full oh, many a dainty horse had he in stable. And when he rode, men mixed his brittle hair, jingling in a whistling wind all clear, and heck his lewd as doth the chapel bell. There as this lord was keeper of the cell, the rail of St. Maur of St. Mene, because that it was all and some deal straight, this ilka monk let all things pass, and hailed after the new world, the spas. He yaf not of that text of holed hen that said that hunters been not holy men. Now that a monk, when that he is reckless, is licking to a fish that is waterless. This is to say, a monk out of his cloister, but the text held he not worth an oyster. And I said his opinion was good. Chaucer said, well, I see what he means. If you think he should stay in his cloister, he doesn't think that old prescription is worth an oyster. And this idea that people who go hunting are not holy men, that it's not a proper pursuit for a holy man, that doesn't make any sense to him. Why should he study and make himself wood upon a book and cloister all the way to poor, or swink him with his hands and labor as Austin did, as St. Austin would have him do? How shall the world be served? Let Austin have his swing to him reserved. Therefore, he was a fricassure of it. He was well fed and well taken care of, well dressed. He liked to go hunting, and he was a monk. And if you say monks shouldn't go hunting, he, he doesn't agree. Now also there's a friar. This friar is a very friendly guy, and he's so friendly that if some young girl in a village that he visits gets pregnant, he'll go out of his way to find a husband for her from among the eligible young men of the village. Sometimes he might even pay for the wedding he had married for many a marriage of younger women at his own cost. Now, why does Chaucer give us this particular detail about the friar? The implication is that he may himself have made these young women pregnant. So his generosity in helping these young girls to find a husband from among the eligible bachelors of their village and his further generosity in sometimes even paying for the weddings at his own cost may have resulted from some degree of self-interest and bears closer examination. Unto his order he was a noble post, for well beloved and familiar was he with Franklins all over his country, and eck with worthy women of the town, for he had poor of confession, as said himself, more than a curate, for all of his order he was licentiate. Full sweetly he heard confession, and pleasant was his absolution. For unto a poor order for the yev, is seen that a man is well he shrive. For if he yaf, he does make a vaunt, he wist that a man was repentant. For many a man, so hard is of his heart, he may not weep, although him sure smart. Well, he heard confession really well, he was good at it, and he was pretty easy going in forgiving uh, people who confess their sins, especially if they, if they were giving good donations. And he was especially 
skillful at hearing the confessions of the worthy women of the town. Some hint here that this friar um, he may be abusing his clerical authority in sexual matters. So the prioress, the monk, and the friar, and also the summoner and the pardoner, whom I have not discussed in this webcast, all are religious characters, all of whom are shown to be ambiguous. Only the parson, another religious character in the poem, is represented as a truly admirable religious figure. With that, I'll conclude this webcast, but as always, if you have questions or comments, please send me an email. Thank you.